Okay. All right, guys, welcome into the lab presented by Champion Circle. You know the deal. Head over to championcircleufm.com. Find out how you can support your Michigan Wolverines and your student athletes. And I don't know, maybe I'm biased, but I think this might be what will be my favorite episode of the lab of all time because we have such a special guest, Jack Harbaugh. And <laughs> first off, we were talking in the pregame. So you're, you, you, you have a saying, who's got it better than us? And you're wearing – the Ravens quarter zip in the Michigan hat. Who's got it better than you? Nobody. I promise you. <laughs> that that's exactly right. And and I know I know the story, but I think our viewers would love to hear you tell the story of where that phrase was born. Because in your interview post game, you said there's a there's a saying we have in the Harbaugh House, and it's exactly that. When did the "Who's got it better than us?" nobody phrase start? It's really hard to pin it down, but as I recall, back in a little town in Crestline, Ohio, we were about uh, 10, 11, 12-year-old kids. In the summertime at 8 o'clock in the morning, our parents would push us out the back door. It wasn't a question of whether you were going outside. The question was with the physical presence that they show to, to push us out. So we all met across the street from where we lived, the South Side School, a little elementary school, big playground and we sandlot if in 1992 there was a movie that came out called sandlot i've watched it 25 times that was the way we grew up so from about eight o'clock to 12 o'clock you had uh, cardboard bases baseballs all taped up with uh with tape baseball bats wooden those days you put little tacks in them and then you'd tape them up and you'd play and and at noon, it came time to eat. And so he just said, where can we go and come over to my house? So we, there were about eight of us, and we'd walk in the back door, never locked doors. We never had a key at our house. There was no such thing as a key. And we always knew where the keys to the car were. They were in the car. You never took them out of the car. They were always there. So we'd go there, have a bowl of soup and maybe a sandwich, then back onto the field, play until dark. And when the sun went down and the street lights went on, you probably you're too young to remember. Kick the can. Oh yeah, you yeah. No, I remember. Talking about you remember no, that? No, I remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We played kick the can until about eight thirty, quarter to nine, and then my dad. I, can you see me? He used to whistle. He'd take these two fingers and put them under his tongue, and it was a loud, shrill whistle. <laughs> and at the the first sound of a whistle was. You sprinted toward home. And if he didn't see you sprinting toward home, when he whistled, I mean, all hell to pay. So that was our day. But the point my make is we would take breaks. It'd be sunny and take breaks. And we'd be all sitting there. We'd be looking at each other. And, we, and we'd look at each other and somebody say, who's got it better than us? Yeah. We get a chance to play ball all day. We get a chance to be with each other. And the nobody came later. I, I, yeah. I don't know how that jumped in there, but it was just like, and it wasn't a loud, it was just like, guys, yeah, who's got it better than us? Yeah. And then so that's that's how it all came about. Oh. And there's been there's been additions and different stories that have gone on, but that's the early remember remembering of it that I have. Oh. That first off, that that's great because I, I actually I do remember kick the can and like my childhood was pre-social media. So like I kind of lived in the transition of like social media, and then social media today has like taken on a whole different deal. Than what it was when it started. So it's been kind of crazy to, my, I grew up on five acres also in Ohio, Jack, and, and me and my brothers, we didn't have an Xbox. We weren't allowed to watch TV, but by, 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 they'd be like, if you're bored, go, go play outside, you know, and we do all the same thing. Um, and it's, it, it's born because you say, who's got it better than us. And you try to really answer it and you realize nobody's got it better than us. Like what more do you need? And, 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 that, and the way we were, we didn't have Little League, no Little League baseball, and nothing, those travel teams and all that. We just, we had ourselves, we did have a, twice a week, we would go to another park and, and we had a rec director there that was the old football and basketball coach. And, and he would umpire the games from behind the, the pitcher, you know, just, we had no uniforms. I mean, you'd wear your own t-shirt and hat and everything and we'd play and, and we would uh, play those games. But kids today miss a little bit. Yeah. We organized. We had to, we had to choose up teams. You know, I'll take so. You know, you, you, first of all, you had a bat. You take the bat and you would play chips up the bat, and then you would hold it. And if you could throw it over your shoulders 
for 10 yards and you'd measure the, then you got to be the first, the guy that picked the first guy. So you'd pick your teams and there was always a guy that was last. He was last every time. I'm not going to mention his name. Well, mention his name, but he was always, but there was no problem with that. Yeah. There weren't any parents to judge their son being last, but yeah. he, he played right field and he had as much fun, if, if more fun than, than we did. And, uh, and, but leaders came out of that. Kids yeah. came out of that. Then they were the leaders in junior high school. They were the leaders in high school. They went off and were leaders somewhere else, but those leaders were developed through a process without having all the, uh, the, people involved that that we have now does that make sense it no it makes complete sense and i don't want to make too big of a jump but what i really wanted to ask you about is like what makes a good coach because i i agree you know some of it has been lost but what if it hasn't all been lost you know because i look at this michigan team this year and i see the way they 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 chose their leader mikey saner still is the only one to walk out as the only represent representative of michigan in front of three alabama crimson tide players and I, I think the right leader, yourself, Coach Harbaugh, Jim Harbaugh, Coach John Harbaugh, they can instill those things and give the players an opportunity to, to relive those moments. You know, it takes a leader to do it. So when, when you're going through that in your childhood, how, how much of that did you draw on in your coaching career and in your fatherhood of, of Jim and John? Well, I, I think there, there was a progress and there, there was a development. But then, then you develop a kind of a, a, a mantra. You just develop a style. And I think it, it all, the foundation in my, of mine was, was it on that playground. But then eventually, how you decide to, to carry yourself in the locker room, how you have a tendency to, 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 to speak out, how you have a tendency to, to work harder than anyone else, how you have a tendency to, to call when people are, are straying off the reservation, so to speak, somebody yeah. stands up and says, hey, come on back. You yeah. control the locker room to some extent. And then with your players, your teammates, they realize who those people's, people right. are. And right. I know, Jake, when you were here with Jim, they voted on the captains. The players did. Yeah. I mean, it was a fair – what we used to do is – we didn't count the boat boats. Once the boats came in, the players counted the boats. We had yeah. guys that went in and counted them, and they came back and told us who the captain. We want no thought that the coaches were mm. involved in that vote whatsoever. This was theirs, and they know who the leaders are because they're with them 24 hours a day in some cases. They're on the practice. They're in the locker room. They know who the complainers are, who the uh, – uh, they and eventually they vote those four guys that they trust the most to be their leaders – and there's no greater honor in football than to be selected by your teammates as the captain of their football team. Yeah. I, you know, it's so important because, you know, in 2016, Chris Wormley and I were voted captain. And it was like, man, the, it, it, the purity of the fact that each person gets a blank sheet of paper and they write down who they want to represent them as the leaders of the team is yeah. – truly the greatest honor to be selected by your peers and it's just like you know you, you you talk about the mount like that's how i grew up too you know when we play basketball at recess you're the captain you're the captain you know like it, it just organically happens and it's this and, it, and it's the same reason mikey goes out there as captain yeah. versus alabama and it's the diff it's a subtle difference between yeah. winning and losing yeah and you trust it and, and good football teams first of all they they have someone they can trust as their captain, but, but more importantly, they, they rally around those, those type of people. When they speak, they all listen. And, yeah. uh, and as I say is when you're all done and I imagine you feel this way when all the great things that have happened in your career and all the places you've been to be selected by your teammates as a captain has to be the, the highest honor that could possibly be bestowed upon you. There's nothing you could even compare it to for those reasons. And, and this episode of The Lab is brought to you by Hunter Pasture Homes. Founded in 1999, Hunter Pasture, or HP, has grown to become one of Southeastern Michigan's largest and most respected developers. Over the past two decades, HP has built and developed over 2,000 luxury single-family homes and multifamily condominiums throughout Metro Detroit and many thriving communities. HP and the Forbes company also have over 2,000 luxury multifamily units currently under development. HP is a passionate, 
advocate for the critical role housing plays in economic and community development. So Jack, you had we were talking pre-show about, you know, you had a moment post game with Brad and he's interviewing you and Jackie. And it is my I think it is a favorite my favorite interview I've ever seen. So I first off want to see have you and Jackie fully recovered cuz we got another one on Monday night. We got a quick turnaround. How is Jackie doing? How are you doing from the the Rose Bowl out there in Pasadena? Well, she's doing great. I mean, she's this way every week. I mean, yeah. we, we've been doing this for 62 years now. I don't, and how many years as, as coaches? And we were uh, just this quickly. Uh, we met as freshmen in college in 1957. Uh, we were Bowling Green State University. And, uh, and we were both freshmen and met in a biology class. Uh, dated a little bit for she went off to Europe for a year. And then as seniors, we kind of got more serious about it. Then on November 25th of 1961, we were married. Wedding was at 10 o'clock in the morning. We watched the Ohio State Michigan game in the afternoon. Only one football game on TV in those days. They didn't have from 11 to 2 o'clock in the morning. Watched the Ohio State, went to the reception that evening. And the next day, we went to the Cleveland Brown New York Giant football game in Cleveland Stadium. That's how we celebrated our honeymoon. And then on Monday, we were back to work in uh, Canton, Ohio. I was a junior high school coach there, and she was an elementary teacher, and we were, we were back to work. So that's we, the way we kicked off our, uh, our, uh, our marriage. And, and then on November 25th, 2023, which was a few weeks ago, we celebrated that our 62nd wedding anniversary on a Saturday watching the Ohio State Michigan game in Michigan Stadium. Now what a journey that's yeah, been. Huh? Yeah. I mean, right. You so you 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 it's been 60 plus years in the making right. of practicing for these big moments. So Jackie's as big of a fan and we could see this you know you mentioned Michigan fans just don't get to see her all too much. She's as big of a football fan as anybody. Right, and you were in, and you guys have been enjoying this together for years. I dwarf in your yeah. presence, but the, the what I enjoyed most about it is the fans had a chance to see the, the true foundation of the Harbaugh family yeah. in that, that brief interview. When uh, when the question was asked, "How do you feel?" I mean, I was re- I thought he was asking me the question. I was ready to answer the question and all at once his body jumped in front of me what are you yeah we all saw the interview and i'm thinking "Uh oh (laughs) the world is having a chance to meet the jackie harbaugh that i've known for so long and she said it i mean so sometimes the simplest thing is the truest she said what she said winning what could be better than that (laughs) exactly right (laughs) and then i was going where do i go from this i mean i mean she's totally out out co- kick my coverage as well and and so I'm thinking well who's I only thing I have is our who's behind better than us <laughs> so I threw out my best line yeah and it and it and it absolutely delivered and it was just such an unbelievable moment uh you know for all, all of us in the Michigan community because what happened from that and you you kind of alluded to it where it's like wow that is that's Jim like we could see Coach Harbaugh perfectly encapsulated between you, Jack, and Jackie. And I I wanted to ask you this because, you know, where did it start from you? And I know you talked about your parents there, but like, you know, it it it's it's trickled on down, right? And that's that's a good family. Like it, it was above you at one point. Do you remember when this was instilled in you to then be able to instill it in Jim? I, I don't. I don't know exactly what it, it was a process. Uh, and, and the moment for me, and I've said this several times over the last few days, but uh, I had a football coach at Bowling Green. His name was Doit Perry. The Bowling Green Stadium now is the Doit Perry Stadium. He's a Hall of Fame coach. The first coach he ever hired on his staff at Bowling Green was Bo Schembechler. Bo Schembechler was his offensive line coach. He was a young coach. He had been a graduate assistant at Ohio State went to Presbyterian College for one year, and then he came to Bowling Green as as the coach. Now, I wasn't there when Bo was there, but Doit Perry was was my my first coach that I really gravitated to. But anyway, 
he had a football class, Jake, and the class was eight o'clock in the morning. He taught it. It was kind of a football class, but a, a life lesson type class. Yeah. And the first day, the first thing he did, he said, pull out a piece of paper and I want you to write this down. This is going to be the first question on the final examination. So we all got our paper out, you know, and he goes three things. I'm going to start with number three. Number three, if you're going to be a coach or if you're going to be successful in life, you have had three. You've got to have a love and passion for what you're doing. If you start out and you started and you don't have a love and passion and a, and a drive for that, get out. Do something else. Find something else that you have a love and passion. Love and passion. Number two was you have to outwork anyone and everyone that you come in contact with. The people you work with, the people you're competing against, you have got to outwork them. And he said, the reason I say that is I recruited every single one of you, most every one of you in this room. None of you are ever going to outsmart anyone. So you better be, better be ready to, to outwork them. Number two, outwork, right? Drum roll almost. Number one, marry wisely. Your choice of your lifelong companion will be what, where, what's going to take you to where you, you want to go. And that, and that was said so clearly. And then later that day, I had a chance to meet this young lady. Her name was Jackie Sapiti. C-I-P-I-T-I, -I -I. met her in a biology class. And the professor at that time was Ernie Hamilton, whose son was Scotty Hamilton, the, the ice skater. You may not remember him. He was a world-class ice skater, Olympian, professional. And he, and he was the pro professor, and he would go around and go, and you had to get up and tell him who your name was. And he but he said, uh, Jacqueline Sapiti, or and he called her Chippity, or he, he mispronounced her name. And she jumped out of her seat and she went, it's Sapiti, C-I-P-I-T. And I'm looking, I said, not only is this the most gorgeous person I've ever met in my life, she's got a pop to her. <laughs> yeah. I thought it at all. So very wisely is where it, where it all began for us. And, and uh, she is the head football coach. She yeah. is the head family coach for our family. A yeah. great story. I was here at Michigan coaching with Bo. Come home at about 1130 one night. I didn't have a very good day. Obviously, she didn't have a very good day. And she was on the couch. And Jim was like seven. And John was like eight, nine. And, and she was just sobbing. What, let me tell you what they did. They did this. They did that. I, I don't know if I could. And I kind of lost it. I thought to myself, Jackie, what do you, what can I do? How can I help you? And she said, just listen, just listen to me when I talk about it. don't, you know? And so at that time, here's what we did. And I can remember the day, like it was yesterday. I said, Jackie, we, we are involved with two teams. The team here at home is our most important team. When this whole world comes to an end for us, how we handle this team is going to, is going to tell it all who we really are. You will be the head coach of this team. I will be your loyal assistant. I'll do whatever I possibly can to support you. I will never, ever do anything that's going to, that's going to call, cause a problem. But let's, you're the head coach. That allows me to go to work every day and work with the, uh, players that I coach as a defensive backfield coach, and I can be a teammate there with the other coaches and the players. And, and then in and that team, we can, we can, we can make sure that we, we take care and support that team, two teams. And that one discussion that we had is kind of what we lived off after that. And we still do. Our yeah. kids now are 61 years old and 60 years old and 54 years old. And, and she still does all that with them. Yeah. She makes sure to take care of all the birthdays and she knows all that. And she takes care of the grandkids and making sure that they're, that they're taken care of. And I, and I'm her loyal assistant. If we have to do whatever system, whatever we have to do, I'm, I'm going to do it for you. I hope I didn't talk too long there. No, I, Jack, I could seriously listen to you. Uh, I'm going to go back and I, I'm engaged. So, I mean, th these are such beautiful nuggets. Like seriously, it, it's amazing to hear you talk. And I, I'm, I'm curious you know, what this journey has been like for you and Jackie, you know, I just think about the past few years and 
you know, in the nature of coaching, as you know, I don't need to tell you, it's a roller coaster no matter what you do. You can work hard and do everything right and have the worst season. You might you might have a team that you don't think is good enough and you'll have the best season. That's just the nature of it. But when you think about back in the year of COVID, which was crazy for a number of reasons, and Michigan enters the season unranked in a 0.1% chance by the computers to win, and maybe this is what we're talking about, it's been almost a vertical climb to this point, um, a complete turnaround. What is what has this journey been like for you and Jackie to to see the the climb and now be playing for the ultimate goal of a national title on Monday? We've been observers through the whole thing, really. We've not made a great deal of contributions to it, but the joy of watching how uh, our our youngsters respond to different things. I mean, after that COVID year, I mean, Jim Jim didn't know if they were going to keep him. I mean, he he could have very easily, you know, uh, not been the coach the next year but what he did was he went to work he didn't he didn't pout he didn't moan he didn't make excuses he didn't point fingers he just went out uh along with and and put a staff together and then uh, recruiting and uh turned it up a notch a little bit put more responsibility on the players i think and the players responded by by getting that kind of a trust from him they took it upon themselves to to maybe go over on a bond of uh and doing the things they had to do to make sure that the, the team was in the right place. And then it got on a roll. And then it, then it spills over to the next year where you have a guy like Eden Hutchinson. Yeah. Then he leaves, and then there's a guy sitting over there saying, we need a replacement for him. We need someone to step up in his place. I'm the guy that's going to do it. And you bring four, five, six, seven, ten guys along, along with you. Then the next year turns over again. And then there's a Mikey Sanfrasil, and I, I don't want to go through names and Quorum and JJ and all. I can go through 15, 20, 25 names of guys that said, now it's my turn. I got to step up. And when you get that and it's being passed down from, from year to year, I mean, good things happen. Yeah. And I would, if you would sit down with Jim and you would say to him, uh, how's it, what's the difference in coaching now than maybe five, six, seven years ago? He's going to say, my job's easy. I said, I sit in my office and I can do other things. I can think about practice schedules. I can think about it's different things about football because those things, other things are being handled in the locker room. They're yeah. being handled with your coaching staff. And some things come to you, but you're looking there someday, you feel like, uh, what, what, what am I doing? I, there's not, yeah. I need more work because yeah. of all the different things that are happening around you that are positive. What do you think, uh, you know, just, you know, about when, when, you, when you think of your time as a coaching, uh, as a coach, um, what's like one of the more special parts of it? Of course, like winning is the obvious one and competing for a national title. But it, it seems there's layers to this. And when you talk about these players and watching them develop, mm-hmm. you know, Aiden Hutchinson, you know, Jim recruited him when he was before, you know, he was probably just learning to drive and, you know, and, and to watch him grow and now what he's doing with the lions, you know, what, what do you think is one of the more special parts besides the obvious of winning games uh, of, of coaching? I think even more, even more important than winning games. If I refer to such a thing as possible is the relationships you have with your, with the, your players, the players that you coach. We're at home at four o'clock in the afternoon here in, in Ann Arbor and we get a phone call. And it's from some guy, some player that we had back maybe at Western Kentucky 25 years ago. And he'll call up. He said, this is so-and-so. I know exactly who he is. I can almost tell you what his number was. I can tell you, I don't remember exactly the games that we won and lost with him, but I remember him. And uh, and then we'll, uh, he will uh, say, Coach, you, you, you saved me. He said, I'm here with my family now. I'm here, and I had to give you a call and Mrs. Harbaugh call because you saved me. I wait, Tell me about it. He said, well, when I was a sophomore, I was ready to quit. I was going to leave the team, and I came by the office to tell you that I was going to leave. And he said, you were walking down the hall, and you came over, and you said something, or you grabbed me by the shoulders and, and told me something positive, and I couldn't get it out that I was going to leave. And, and I have no idea what he's talking about. I can't remember the moment. I can't remember anything about it, except it had a life changing thing for him. Now they all, everything wasn't a success like that, but 
those moments you realize why you were a coach yeah. what you have received in benefit from being a coach is that or you go to a you know this you go to a reunion and you go out and you guys sit around and you laugh and you hug each other and the coaches are right there with you hugging you some guy may have chewed you out three or four times but you but right there there's a camaraderie that can't be duplicated in any life experience in my life. And as I say, the co the games and the championships are all important, but those relationships are far out, uh, outreach everything else. Do you think there's a moment, you know, what, you know, when you, when you were raising coach Harbaugh, um, you know, was there a moment when you knew, cause I think a lot of times, you know, I, I don't know. As a kid, I would rebel, you know, like the, the, there was sometimes lessons given to me that I didn't want to hear and I needed to learn things the hard way or, or, or whatever it might've been. But do you remember a time when you knew like, you know, and, and as it applies this week for coach Harbaugh, that like he, and, and even John too, that you had, you know, some, some real potential there guys that could be coaches one day and accomplish great things. Yeah. We had a, uh, you no, know, we had times, we had those moments, you know, when, when all hell breaks loose and that's not going to be tolerated and da 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 and all those things. There's one moment about Jim that I could tell you. I don't think I've ever told this story before, but he was playing Little League Baseball. He was like a 10-year-old, 11-year-old, 12-year-old, and he was a very good player. And they were playing a game, and I'm in the stands, and uh, it's a tight game. It's uh, I believe it was in extra innings. And he's on first base and he's over there going, ha, da, 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 leading off, you know, ha, da. he was kind of being a little bit of a showboat, right? Gets picked off. He's out. Now what he does, he takes his helmet and slams it on the ground out of the game. So he comes over to the bench and I'm in the stands and, uh, and I come down and I, come on, we're gone. We're going home. What? Coach says, no, no, I'll take it. No, no, coach. I will take care of it. Come on, in front of the players and the moms and the dads and everybody. So we had a station wagon. So I opened up the back of the station wagon. He had ridden his bicycle. And John was with him. John had uh, John had come later. John was older and he wasn't on the team, but he was with me. And so I take his bicycle and I throw it in the back of the, the station wagon and slam the door and uh, in the car. So he gets in the front seat and John gets in the back seat. No, 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 no. You're walking home. You're walking home. I'm walking home. I didn't, I didn't do anything. You're walking home. Why am I walking? Well, because you saw this and know that it's ever, you ever perform like that. You ever behave yourself like that. Then you're going to be in the same position that he's in. So walk home and think about that. So he starts walking and Jim gets in the front seat of the car. Now I go off on him. Let me tell you something. You're bigger than most of these kids. You're a little more talented than most of these kids. But I want you to know, one of these days, you're going to come across a guy that's just as big as you are, just as fast as you are, and he's going to eat your lunch. Do you understand? I'm off on him, right? And he's sitting there, and he's, I, he starts to, <laughs> start to cry, and he goes, Dad. Someday I want to be that guy that's bigger than stronger. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I did? I swear to God what I did. I looked over and he was and I smiled and I thought, I think he's got I think he's got this thing figured out. Yeah. It brings back just uh, you know, I've had so many of those car rides with my dad and I just think like those it's those pivotal moments. There's a thousand stories you know I'll forget, but I'll remember how my dad made me feel in those moments and how grateful I am for the accountability. And as you get talking there, you say, Hey, one day you're gonna meet someone that's as big as you and as strong as you and as fast as you. And isn't that the national championship on Monday? Isn't that a 14 and 0 Washington Huskies team both trying to accomplish something, right? What a great tie in. What a yeah. great because you're exactly right. And and you and you know what, parents, uh, that we learned we were, you know, we wanted to be those hard nosed and don't do cross me and don't you talk back and all that thing. But I look back at our experience with our three three kids and Jackie and myself both. You know, there were times that I mean, you just things you couldn't tolerate and you and you try to put a put a stop to it. Right. And when sometimes you 
you know, you got a little loud and, and that type of, but I think it's the communication you have over the dinner table. Mm-hmm. You know, they might say something, you don't have to just make a point. Think about that for a second. I mean, it's, yeah. it's parenting is not, you know, muscling up or, or being loud or you're around other parents and you want those other parents to think that you're a real, that you're a real tough guy and, and yeah. all that. So you get, you get loud, you're, you're performing and I don't think you're helping the kids at all. Yeah. I mean, those quiet moments when you sit down on the, on the bed with them and how'd your day go and yeah. a rough day to day. And, and uh, my dad used to do this with me. What happened? Well, I, this guy, he's, he's two years older than me and he came up and he, he told me he's going to, he's going to, he's going to take me out. He's going to do this or he's going to do, and, you know, the bullying thing that we talk about today, my dad, and I learned this with our kids. Oh, Jack, uh, what are you going to do about it? I said, well, what, what, he says, well, just figure it out and tell me what you're going to do about it. And I'm going to ask you that again tomorrow. So he'd ask me, he said, how'd that go today? Well, you know, he, he pushed me around again. And then I said, well, what are you going to do about it tomorrow? And he, and finally he came back and he said, you know, I shoved him back or whatever, you know, I, I responded, you know, and I'm not getting bullied anymore. And, uh, that, that's the response that you're looking for. Don't, I'm not going to do it for you. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to put, I'm going to ask you to put yourself and I'm not telling you how to do it either, but yeah. I'm going to keep asking you, what did you do about it until you do something about it? It's those kind of moments. It's not, you don't, you don't, you don't live their life for them, but yeah. you give them the tools to be able to put their own life together. And it's piecing it together over a period of time. And, uh, and, uh, and then you just get on your knee and pray and, and yeah. hope that all will go well. That's one thing I've been thinking about a lot. Like, cause when you hear it spoken to you, they're like retention is, you know, whatever percent. And then, the, then they say, Hey, if I speak it or I write it, my write it down myself, retention's a little bit higher, but if I can teach it back to you and it comes from my own, my own logic, then I have it in, in being a good parent is then asking questions so I can work through the way I understand it and get it back to you because then I'm teaching it to you right. and then I have it and then I can draw on it later. Yeah. You're not a dictator. You're not an authoritarian. You're a teacher. Yeah. Dwight Perry, this guy that is great wisdom about marrying also had another piece of advice that I've carried with me in that same class. He taught about coaching and teaching were synonymous. I had to look that word up. When he said it, I really didn't know what synonymous meant, but coaching and teaching is synonymous. To be a good coach, you have to be a teacher. You don't have to be a loud, uh, you don't have to be whatever, whatever you might think a coach is. I mean, you just, you're, you've got to be a teacher. And there's hundreds of ways to teach things because you need a hundred ways to teach because people learn at a different level, different, different ways of learning. Some people visual, some people have to do it. Some people, you know, you know what I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah. Yeah. And then later when I got into the, the, with the kids, parenting, teaching, coaching, and parenting are synonymous. If you're going to be, you got to, you got to be the great teacher with your children to be classified as a, as a good parent. And we just, and what, what we do, we, there's no secret. I mean, there's no path. I mean, as I say, you get down on your knees and you pray and pray that you're doing the right thing and pray you don't overreact and, and, and pray that there's going to be a good, re, good result at the end. And, and it's a, it's a process. Mm-hmm. Jack, uh, I know you got a, a busy weekend coming up and we'll, we'll be, well, I'm heading to Houston today, so uh, I'll make sure to come say hey to you when I see you down there. Uh, just just kind of in closing before we let you run. And first off, thanks so much for your time and thanks so much for your stories and your wisdom. I mean, this is seriously one of the my favorite conversations I've had all season. I really appreciate it. Um, just to put a bow on it. Hey, you know, you, you've, you've seen your two sons coach against each other in a Super Bowl. And it's been a long climb back. Like those opportunities may never come again. When you're there, they may never come again. And yet here's another opportunity for Jim to, to play for a national title. What are you and Jackie most looking forward to on Monday night? What I'm we're looking forward to is this team. We go back. I go back to the 70s with Bo Beck. I came here in 1973. And he had the team, the team, the team. And I think people take that a little bit for granted now. 
But if Bo were here today and and uh, they would he, they would ask Bo to describe this team, he would look you in the eye and he'd give it that Bo Schembeck. He said, the team, the team, the team. This is a team. And what I would like for on Monday night is my heart, I believe that. And I believe if Monday they're going to play their very, very best game that they've ever played. And they're going to showcase all of the football world that they belong here and they deserve to be called national champions. And if they play like that, whatever the result, yep. and I'll be so proud and so happy. People have been asking me, like, what do you think about the game? And I said, there's one thing I know for sure. I believe it in my heart of hearts. That team is going to play their best football game of all season. They're going to be more unified than we've ever seen them. That's all I can tell you. That's, right. I, that's all I can tell you. And really, that's all I care about anyways. And maybe, you know, another another popular saying we have on here, almost prophecy, Blake Corum. Yeah. Those who stay will be champions, Jack. Yeah. Those who stay will be yeah, champions. Yeah, yeah. It's been the seed was planted. We've been watering it. We've been tended to it. Those who stay will be champions. So as we as we wrap this up, there's only one way I would know how to close this one, Jack, because it, it, this I've, I can say it with you. Who's got it better than us? No, no. <laughs> That's right, man. Thank you so much, Jack. Seriously, this is this has been a pleasure to talk to you. We really appreciate your time. I will see you down in Houston, uh, hopefully this weekend, but definitely on Monday night. And to our viewers, guys, thanks so much for tuning in. 